Welcome to Forgotten TV, the podcast that brings you TV memories from the 70s and 80s, from fondly remembered to obscure, short-lived TV shows, pilots, and made-for-TV movies. I'm your host, Chris Cooling. This episode, as we hit the one-year anniversary of Forgotten TV, we take a break from the usual format of an in-depth look at one particular TV series. At Forgotten TV so far, we've looked at short-lived shows, Cliffhangers, Super Train, The Fantastic Journey, Otherworld, The Highwayman, Lucan, and The Phoenix, as well as a four-part overview of live-action superheroes of the 70s and a fun look at weird live-action Saturday morning TV. Some of these episodes contain little-known or previously unknown details about the shows, the actors, or creators. If you've missed any of these, go back and check them out on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, or any podcast app. This episode, I introduce a new segment later in the show, and we say goodbye to some familiar faces. And I'm happy to bring you the first Forgotten TV interview as we take a look at the Forgotten TV era with Ernie Hudson. Ernie Hudson, an American actor with over 230 acting credits, is probably best known for his film role in the Ghostbusters movies. Originally from Benton Harbor, Michigan, Hudson had a short stint in the U.S. Marine Corps and then moved to Detroit, where he became the resident playwright at Concept East, the oldest black theater in the country. To further his writing and acting skills, he enrolled at Wayne State University, where he, alongside his peers, directed and acted in their own works. After graduating, he continued his education at the Yale School of Drama. But before he became more widely known for his film roles, he got his start on late 70s TV. Ernie's first TV appearance was June 1977 on the fourth episode of Man from Atlantis as a shirtless minion. Not content to just take IMDb's word for it, I tracked down that episode and screenshotted his walk-on role and screen credit. IMDb is sometimes wrong. Agents and managers and overzealous fans with IMDb accounts sometimes submit inaccurate information. He did appear in small roles in a couple of TV movies, including the award-winning 1978 miniseries King, which told the story of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., as well as a handful of appearances on shows like Fantasy Island, Black Sheep Squadron, and The Incredible Hulk. After only three years on the acting scene, Hudson was cast as a regular on a late-season replacement series for NBC. Highcliff Manor, a haunting new comedy. Helen has just inherited her late husband's strange mansion, and it's even stranger occupants. That woman around will never sell our plan for cloning the world's leaders. Speaking as a scientist, my advice is make tracks. Highcliff Manor, right after Who Done It Thursday. High Cliff Manor aired from April 12th to May 3rd, 1979 on Thursday nights at 7.30 Central. Created by Brad Buckner and produced by Alan Landsberg Productions for NBC, this is a really obscure show. There's no Wikipedia page for it, and even though the network ordered six episodes, only three ever aired. The show did not last long against CBS's The Chisholms and ABC's Angie, benefiting from the Mork and Mindy lead-in. I could find no recordings of any entire episode. The $1,000 VHS VCR had just hit America a year and a half ago. Suffice it to say, there aren't a lot of recordings from such short-run shows from this time period. On Highcliff Manor, Helen Black played by Shelley Fabre, was a recently widowed lady who inherited a huge creepy stone mansion on a gothic island off the coast of New England. The manor was the home of the Black Foundation, a think tank science institute populated with a wide assortment of strange characters, including mad scientist Dr. Francis Kisgadden, mechanical man Bram Shelley, womanizing preacher Ian Glenville, huge Korean assistant Chang, Sexy Secretary Wendy, Creepy Housekeeper Rebecca, and Evil Dr. Sanchez. They all wanted to get rid of Helen so they could get on with their plans of cloning all the world's leaders. As I said, Shelley Fabre starred as Helen Black, the widow of the Foundation's founder. Shelley was probably remembered best as Mary Stone from The Donna Reed Show. Ernie Hudson was Smythe, the valet to the late Mr. Black. 
The series also starred Audrey Landers, Ginny O'Hara, Stephen McCaddy, and Luis Avalos, who many listeners my age will remember from the 650 episodes of The Electric Company he appeared on. After an extremely short stint on High Cliff Manor and several more appearances in shows from The White Shadow to One Day at a Time to Little House on the Prairie, as well as a four-episode stint on Flamingo Road, Ernie's fate was changed forever when he was added to the cast of 1984's Ghostbusters as the fourth Ghostbuster, Winston Zedmore, and Ernie was cemented in pop culture forever. Do you believe in UFOs, astral projections, mental telepathy, ESP, clairvoyance, spirit photography, telekinetic movement, full trance mediums, the Loch Ness Monster, and the theory of Atlantis? Uh, if there's a steady paycheck in it, I'll believe anything you say. Work started picking up, and immediately following Ghostbusters, Ernie had a recurring role on St. Elsewhere. Then, in 1985, Ernie joined Adam West. Danny Dark, and Casey Kasem as a voice actor on the Super Powers team, Galactic Guardians, the ninth incarnation of ABC's Saturday morning, Super Friends. Next Saturday, blast off into adventure with the Super Powers team. Join Superman, Firestorm, and Cyborg as they battle galactic monsters. Destroy them now. It's the brand new adventures of the Super Powers team. Next Saturday. As a result, long before 2017's Justice League or any of the DC animated film universe, Ernie Hudson became the first person to portray Cyborg on screen. This was the final version of the Super Friends. The team name, Super Friends, was changed to the Super Powers team to tie in with the Kenner toy line. Unlike previous incarnations, gone was Ted Knight's narration. In fact, the majority of episodes had no narration. The characters of Firestorm and Cyborg replaced the Wonder Twins as the target audience identification figures and were prominently featured in episodes. And the animation and tone started to take on a more serious look and resemble the art depicted in the DC Comics. The show lasted only one season on ABC, marking the end of Hanna-Barbera's 12-year run of the Super Friends. Ernie's role on the Super Powers team led to other voice acting roles over the years. Pound Puppies, Batman the Animated Series, Superman, Transformers Prime, all had Ernie appear as a voice actor. In 1986, Ernie ran into Adam West again when he was cast in the comedy series The Last Precinct. Watch out for the cockeyed cops of The Last Precinct. They didn't graduate from the police academy. They escaped to The Last Precinct, premiering right after the Super Bowl. In a sort of Police Academy meets Animal House, The Last Precinct is the only sitcom from Stephen J. Cannell Productions, and in an odd creative choice, had a one-hour runtime, instead of the typical 30-minute length for a comedy. The title The Last Precinct referred to both the location of L.A.'s 56th Precinct, on the jurisdictional border between the LAPD and the county sheriff's office, and the fact that this was the dumping ground for all of the eccentrics and misfits of the LAPD, and was more akin to a ramshackle frat house than a police station. The Last Precinct pilot aired January 26, 1986, on NBC, right after the Super Bowl. After being greenlit, the series returned in April for an additional seven episodes before being canceled. In April and May, it bridged the gap between Riptide and Miami Vice on Friday nights. Because of the three-month gap after the pilot airing, NBC aired a 40-second intro before the opening theme to remind viewers what the show was about. Here come the cockeyed cops from the last precinct. Interesting possibility. <laughs> Meet Sergeant Price. He's the brains of the outfit. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a show. And Night Train is his partner. I'm hot up in Chinese arithmetic. Now, Mel will break your heart. He used to be a guy, but now he's a girl. If you know what I mean. Good man, that woman. And Officer Reed is slightly overweight and very oversexed. I love this! All under the watchful eye of Captain Rob Wright. This is one nutty precinct. They're the craziest bunch of cops that ever hit the streets. Yabba dabba doo. They didn't graduate from the police academy. They escaped to the last precinct. In charge of the precinct, sort of, 
was Straight Arrow Captain Rick Wright, played by Adam West, who often seemed oblivious to the goings-on in the precinct. His officers included Handsome Price Pascal, played by Jonathan Perpick, the closest officer the 56th had to a normal policeman. Raid, a bumbling, overweight motorcycle cop. Rena, played by Lucy Lee Flippin, the amorous records clerk with the hots for Raid. Night Train, a plainclothes officer who dressed like a pimp, played, of course, by Ernie Hudson. Mel Brubaker, a sexy, mini-skirted, post-op, transgender officer. King, an Elvis impersonator played by Pete Wilcox. Alphabet, a stereotypically polite Indian exchange officer. And Over the Hill veterans Butch, played by longtime character actor Keenan Wynn, and Sundance, played by Hank Rollicky, who you might recognize from the Rocky films. Wingshauser and James Cromwell rounded out the cast. Yes, this show was obviously heavily influenced by the Police Academy movies, complete with characters seemingly lifted from those films, with maybe a little of Leslie Nielsen's Police Squad thrown in. The series started off raucous and raunchy, well, for a broadcast network, but became lighter comedy as the episodes progressed. Still, the humor was uneven, often hit and miss, with plenty of stereotypes and characters or even titles on the screen breaking the fourth wall, speaking directly to the audience. Also, the odd one-hour format often meant stories that were better suited for a 30-minute show were stretched to fit the time slot. For an extensive consideration of The Last Precinct, I recommend you listen to the Cancel Too Soon podcast, episode 53. Like the Phoenix, Misfits of Science, Street Hawk, Manimal, and other forgotten TV shows, The Last Precinct faced off against CBS ratings powerhouse Dallas and was canceled within two months. See you next week. Same bad time, same bad station. Recently, at a public appearance, Ernie Hudson was gracious enough to sit down and talk with me about his forgotten TV era roles. I'm here with actor Ernie Hudson at Eggman's Toy Show in San Antonio. Ernie, it's great to have you here and to be able to chat with you today. Um, one of the hardest working actors in show business with uh, over uh, 230 credits. And you're right up there with uh, William Shatner and Malcolm McDowell and uh, uh, some of the guys that uh, do a lot of work. Most recently as uh, Sergeant Conrad in, uh, on Fox's APB. And we've seen you on uh, Criminal Minds, Heroes, uh, all the way back to the 80s with The Last Precinct and Broken Badges. What is it with you and police roles, do you think? Well, you know, I've done my share of police roles. It's, it's all work. I mean, I like to think the characters are all a little different. But, um, yeah, you know, I mean, maybe that's uh, how they see me, whoever casts or whoever thinks of I me. Mean, I don't know. Um, but, you know, I've done, you know, I mean, Congo, it wasn't a policeman or, you know, the hand rocks a cradle or I can go on and on and on. But, um, yeah, no, it's um, it's apparently how the industry has seen me a lot of the times. What do you think that, uh, or how do you uh, make that role like fresh or different, stepping into that same type of role again and again? Well, I I don't really think of them as being the same type of roles. I mean, uh, every story is different and every character is a little bit different. Um, So, yeah, it's it's all very, each, each story is different, that's all. And so, you know, the situation is different. You're working with different people. Yeah, I think if it was, if I felt like it was doing, stepping into and doing the same thing over and over again, I, I wouldn't, I would have stopped acting a long time ago. The two of those roles back in, uh, back in the 80s were uh, Broken Badges and also The Last Precinct, where you starred with the late Adam West. Right. And that, that show wasn't on for long. I mean, it was only eight episodes. But do you have any memories or any favorite, a favorite memory maybe of working with uh, Adam, Adam West? No, I liked Adam. He's a um, really funny guy, kind of a goofy guy. And he was always um, fun to work with. I mean, he was always, uh, uh, you know, in good spirits. And um, I just, you know, we became friends and, and remained friends 
you know, up until he passed recently. But, um, yeah, I just I really liked Adam. He, uh, uh, just a really good guy. And, um, yeah, just had a very unique um, character. And I just it was great to work with him. Well, Forgotten TV is all about the 70s and 80s, uh, anything 70s and 80s TV. And I saw that one of your earliest roles was on uh, Man from Atlantis. And, of course, you made the rounds. You were on Incredible Hulk, Little House on the Prairie, A-Team. Um, and you were really uh, making the, the rounds as uh, TV guest star after Ghostbusters, of course, when you broke out in 1984. Is there a TV role from that era that stands out in your memory? Well, I think on some level they all do. I mean, somebody mentioned Black Sheep Squadron a few minutes ago. And uh, I mean, they all do. They're all very special in their own way. And, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know if any is more special than the other. But in their own way, they, um, they kind of all add up to building, you know, um, you know, your craft and, you know, finding out about yourself. So it was just it was a good time. It was a good time to... Uh, experiment and try some things. Now is a different time, so I tend not to, you know, just take a job just for the experience. I mean, and now it's at a point where you want to take a job because it's, it's going to be fun. But uh, uh, but back in those days, it was just fun to be working. And with the prevalence of all of the new uh, digital channels that there are, with the MeTV and Antenna TV and so forth, and we see you pop up now and again on Fantasy Island or Black Sheep Squadron, like we were saying. Um, after Ghostbusters, you started picking up some voice work, and you were actually the first actor to, re to represent uh, the character Cyborg on screen, animated or otherwise. And that character has become popular on the animated Teen Titans and in the upcoming uh, Justice League movie coming out next month. Is that on your list of movies to go see? Um, you know, I mean, I, I like um, uh, some of the, um, you know, the action stuff and the animated. I mean, I... Um, I don't know if I have a list of things to see, but um, yeah, I look forward to, to seeing it. It was great working on that show, um, you know, the superheroes back in the day. Uh, voiceover is a whole different experience than you know live action. So, uh, but yeah, I look forward to. It. As uh, I think of uh, Spider-Man, a new Spider-Man uh, coming out, and um, um, uh, that, and and you know. And I do some work in it, so it's always fun to do the animated stuff. But it's just, you know, but I'm an actor, so I work, and it's that's part of the work. Notably absent from that list is the real Ghostbusters animated cartoon that uh, they came out with about two years right after the Ghostbusters film. Um, and I read that you had they actually had you audition for the role of Winston Zedmore for uh, for that cartoon. Is uh, is that uh, accurate? Well, yeah, they asked me to come in. The director wanted to hear my voice. They didn't um, pose it like I was auditioning, but I suppose at the end of the day, that's probably what it was. I was working on some TV show, and they uh, said they felt that uh, they thought someone had said I didn't want to do it, which is why they went on to Arsenio. I have no idea. I mean, I would like to have done it, and uh, that didn't happen, so... Um, but I think the director, truthfully, I think the director probably wanted Arsenio from the beginning and, and couldn't say that. So, for whatever reason. Um, but I did go in and read for the director, uh, but it didn't work out. So, yeah. Arsenio, I, I, he did a good, uh, pretty good job on, uh, on the show, I believe. He's, I think you're friends with him, at least is what I read. So, at least it went to somebody that, uh, that did well. Uh, I've seen you at your table throughout the years at various shows. It's good to see you at one of the smaller shows here in our fair city in San Antonio. Um, I want to thank you very much uh, for being with me uh, today on Forgotten TV. Sure. Okay, great, man. Good talking to you. Such a treat to be able to sit down and talk with Ernie and for being the first interview on Forgotten TV. Currently, you can catch Ernie Hudson on the Netflix series Grace and Frankie. Forgotten TV News. And now for a new segment on Forgotten TV, covering news relevant to the Forgotten TV era. For the first time since the Sci-Fi Channel aired good programming in the early 90s, The Fantastic Journey returned to American television over the last two Sunday nights on broadcast channel Get TV. 
a group of travelers trapped on an island in the Bermuda Triangle on a journey through zones of time, seeking a way home, was the premise. Jared Martin, Roddy McDowell, and Ike Eisenman appeared in the cast. The Forgotten Journey was considered in Episode 9 of Forgotten TV. Ike Eisenman was also just interviewed on a podcast called Obscurity Knox about the fantastic journey, and I'll link to that in the show notes. An update to the last podcast on the Phoenix. If you haven't listened to that, go back and listen to episode 17. The Phoenix was created by husband and wife writing team Anthony and Nancy Lawrence. I discovered recently that Nancy unfortunately passed away in recent years. Anthony Lawrence now living at the Motion Picture Television Fund Retirement Home, has found love again and remarried just a couple of years ago. Anthony and his new wife, Maddie, are believed to be the first two residents of the MPTF Retirement Home to meet and marry in the home's 75-year history. I'll link to the wonderful article from the LA Times that covers this story. Steve Austin, astronaut. A man barely alive. Gentlemen, we can rebuild him. We have the technology. We have the capability to make the world's first bionic man. Steve Austin will be that man. Better than he was before. Better. Stronger. Faster. Yes, The Six Million Dollar Man debuted 45 years ago on March 7, 1973. It would not return to a series until January of 74, where it ran for five seasons and 99 episodes. Also, 30 years ago, on March 7, 1988, ABC Network ran the pilot for Probe on its ABC Monday Night Movie. The world of fandom would never be the same, thanks to the brilliant Austin James and his tech-savvy world, as well as the quick-thinking Mickey Castle by his side. Probe will be considered this year on Forgotten TV. Coming to the CW on March 29th, the most interesting of crossovers is about to happen on the hit series Supernatural. In the episode Scooby Natural, Sam and Dean Winchester, played by Jared Padalecki and Jensen Ackles, receive a gift from a grateful pawn shop owner after they defeat a stuffed dinosaur, that of a free television set. This, however, is no normal TV set, and it ends up transporting the Winchesters into an episode of Scooby-Doo. The Scooby-Doo Supernatural crossover airs March 29th. The National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences has announced that legendary TV producers Sid and Marty Croft will be honored with Lifetime Achievement Awards this year during the Daytime Emmy Awards. The Croft Brothers will be honored at the 45th Daytime Creative Arts Emmy Awards, which will take place on Friday, April 27th. Back on episodes 11 and 12 of Forgotten TV, we considered many Sid and Marty Croft shows as part of Saturday Morning Weirdness. The Warner Archives streaming service is shutting down. Launched in 2013 as Warner Archive Instant, the service offered subscribers a mix of films, TV shows, and made-for-TV movies drawn from the Warner Brothers Library. Some of the TV shows available at one time or another included Kane's Hundred, Man from Atlantis, Logan's Run, Beyond Westworld, Search, Jericho, The Jimmy Stewart Show, and Lucan. The good news for subscribers, Warner Archive has partnered with another subscription streaming service called Filmstruck. All existing subscribers to Warner Archive's streaming service are now Filmstruck members. Most of the films available through Warner Archive's streaming service are now streaming through Filmstruck. The bad news, none of the Warner Archive television programming has moved to Filmstruck. According to Warner, its streaming service will cease to exist after April 26th. The Warner Archive Collection, which releases films and TV shows on DVD or Blu-ray, is unaffected by the streaming service shutdown.
On April 3rd, Linda Carter will be awarded the 2,632nd star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Patty Jenkins, who directed the 2017 film Wonder Woman, is slated to be a guest speaker at the dedication ceremony. Undoubtedly, the success of that film has led to a spotlight, being aimed once again at Linda Carter, now age 66, who personifies the role. Congratulations to Linda, and hopefully we'll see you in Wonder Woman 2. David Odgen Stiers has died at age 75. After an initial six years of his acting career was spent as a guest actor on various TV shows, his big break came in 1977 when he joined the cast of M.A.S.H. in season six as Major Charles Emerson Winchester III. After M.A.S.H., he appeared on numerous Perry Mason TV movies as D.A. Michael Reston. And he had a number of guest starring roles on genre TV, such as Star Trek The Next Generation, The Outer Limits, The Dead Zone, Stargate Atlantis, as well as the permanently shelved 1997 TV movie Justice League of America. Longtime TV film writer and producer Paul DeMeo has died. If you're not familiar with Paul's work, he is one of the two men, along with Danny Bilson, primarily responsible for bringing 1990s The Flash series to TV. He also wrote the original Trancers 1984 film, 1985's Zone Troopers, and created the 1992 series Human Target, as well as Viper and the Sentinel. You may have caught the Easter egg homage to him and Danny Bilson in a recent episode of the current CW series, The Flash. Mickey Jones, a character actor who appeared in shows like Galactica 1980, Flow, The Incredible Hulk, Auto Man, V the Series, and Something is Out There, has died at the age of 76. He was a backup drummer also with two decades of work and 17 gold records to show for it. His IMDb page reveals 136 acting credits. Veteran stage and screen actor John Mahoney, of course recognized for playing Dear Dad Martin Crane for 11 seasons on the sitcom Frasier, passed away at the age of 77. Not many know he was a regular voice actor, providing voices on films like Ants, the Disney animated Atlantis films, The Iron Giant, Kronk's New Groove, as well as playing Sideshow Bob's father on The Simpsons. In film, he was Lloyd Dobler's father on Say Anything. He appeared alongside Dreyfus and DeVito on Ten Men. But my favorite role was probably Lieutenant Colonel Conroy on 1986's The Manhattan Project. Next time on Forgotten TV. Meet three sisters. Now meet their brothers. Greg's the leader and the good man for the job. There's another boy by the name of Peter. The end of the world. Cities rising in the sky. Freeway traffic jetting by. Future's here for us to see. It's 2280. The final frontier. are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. From the Brady Kids to Partridge Family 2200 AD to Star Trek, the animated series, we look at animated versions of live-action shows. You won't believe what I dug up. Next time on Forgotten TV. Forgotten TV is not affiliated with Alan Landsberg Productions. Hanna-Barbera Productions, Stephen J. Cannell Productions, or any TV network or production company involved in the making of any series or movie mentioned on this podcast. Audio clips are included for the purposes of review, commentary, and criticism only and are not intended to infringe. And I'd like to thank the following YouTube channels for making audio clips in this episode possible. Warner Archive, Gilmore Box, Mel Jardin, Retro Static, Huey 1972, Patrick Beyond the Toon Room More, Sean MC, and a special thanks to Ernie Hudson.
If you'd like an easy way to support Forgotten TV, please click through to Amazon on the show notes and do your regular shopping. It doesn't cost you anything extra, and it's a great way to support the show. Forgotten TV is a member of the Frequent Wire podcast network. For more great podcasts, click the link to Frequent Wire in the show notes. For content beyond what's found in the podcast, be sure and follow the Forgotten TV Facebook page and follow Forgotten TV on Twitter. And all that is linked up for you at Forgotten.tv. I'm your host, Chris Cooling, and this has been Forgotten TV. Forgotten TV.